Hello, this lecture is going to be covering the information from chapter 11 of your Marib text, um, which is just basics of the nervous system and nervous tissue. The next four chapters are all going to be um, more specific about different parts of the nervous system. So we're just going to be talking about basic um, setup, what types of cells will be found, and then um, physiologically what's happening in our nervous tissue. Um, this lecture probably is going to have two or three parts, depending on how long um, I talk, but <laughs> uh, make sure you watch all of them. Okay, so to start, the nervous system, hopefully everyone knows what it is, but is the master controlling and communication system of the body. So cells in the nervous system are going to communicate um, a few different ways. They're going to have electrical communication as well as chemical communication. Okay, and we'll talk a little bit more specifically later about um, where those different types of communication is happening. But the communication is going to be very rapid, right? The nervous system is controlling um, all of our bodily functions. So we want to make sure that the communication is happening quick so that we can respond quickly to different stimuli um, or dangerous threats, whatever it may be. Um, and also, obviously, communication is going to be specific. So if we want to move a certain part of our body or to run, we have to have coordinated movements. Um, so our, the information coming, in, coming from the nervous system is going to be specific. Okay. Um, and the communication is so rapid, it's almost an immediate response. So you'll see a little bit of a delay. Um, but if you're trying to measure it, you're not going to be able to measure um, the time with just a simple sp uh, stopwatch. But if you do some uh, physiological experiments, you may see a little bit of a delay. Okay. So the nervous system has three general overlapping functions. Um, so the first is going to be sensory input. So information is gathered by the sensory receptors in our body, which we talked about in the integumentary system. Um, and it's going to collect information about different changes. So those changes can be internal or external. Um, so in the integumentary system, we talked about a lot of external sensory receptors um, feeling different uh, types of pressure, pain, um, temperature stimuli. So those will all be examples of external, ex external stimuli. There's also internal sensory receptors monitoring things within our body. Okay, so um, our heart rate, blood pressure, different, um, you know, internal functions also are going to be sensed by these sensory receptors. Um, the second function of the nervous system is integration, which is the processing and interpretation of that sensory input. Okay, so the sensory information comes in and it gets integrated within the nervous system so our body figures out what to do with it. Um, and then the third function is motor output. So that is going to be the activation of some sort of effector. Um, so we talked about effectors before, but it can be any type of muscle or gland that's going to produce a response in the body. Okay, so we talked about this um, in chapter two, maybe, when we talked about homeostasis, or three, I don't remember what chapter it was now. Um, but this is generally the same kind of setup um, as, you, as we talked about when we talked about homeostasis, right? There's some sort of sensory... Um, receptor that senses some sort of change in the body, that information is integrated, um, which causes some sort of motor output, right, to change, to get our body back to that homeostatic balance. Um, so the nervous system does this uh, with every sort of sensory information that's coming in, um, not necessarily just to maintain homeostasis, but to respond to external stimuli, okay? So this chart kind of shows um, the basic functions of the nervous system. So again, we're going to have sensory receptors out in the periphery, meaning um, the outside of our body, let's say. Those receptors are going to sense something. So it can be your eyes sensing, you see something, your smell, taste, um, touch, hearing, all those are types of sensations, right? That sensory inf information comes into our body through sensory input. The information is going to be integrated so the brain is going to figure out what to do with that information, um, what kind of response it wants to create. And then once it figures out what we want to do, there's going to be some sort of motor output. Okay, And again, the motor output um, is going to affect something. So the um, organ it's going to be affecting is called the effector. Okay, So I should write up here too, we have a sensory receptor 
at the start of all of this. Okay, so it can be something as simple as you see a glass of water and you want to drink it. So you see the water, you figure out where it is in space. The integration center um, is going to figure out what muscles it needs to activate to go out and reach and grab that glass of water and then sending that information out to the effector to do so. Um, but obviously can be uh, a bunch of different things in this system, right? So any type of um, reflex, or if you touch something hot, your hand pulling away quickly, all of that stuff is going to go through the same basic pathway, okay? We can divide the nervous system into two main parts, our central nervous system, or CNS, and our peripheral nervous system, or PNS, okay? So our central nervous system consists of the brain and spinal cord, which you should remember from the first chapter is found in the dorsal body cavity. Um, and the CNS is going to be the integration and control center. Um, so those three functions that we talked about on the last slide, central nervous system is going to be responsible for just integrating information. The peripheral nervous system is everything that's not the brain and spinal cord that is made up of nervous tissue. Um, so you're going to see there's going to be cranial nerves, different spinal nerves, um, and these are going to extend from the brain and spinal cord out to the periphery or like the appendages outside of the body, okay? So our spinal nerves are going obviously to and from the spinal cord and our cranial nerves are coming to and from the brain, okay? Um, so if I zoom in here, central nervous system again is just the brain and spinal cord. Um, so this fleshy colored stuff found in the dorsal body cavity. The peripheral nervous system is all the other nerves going through our body. Okay, so if our brain and spinal cord are integrating the information, figuring out how to respond to some sort of stimuli, the information obviously has to come in a certain way and go out a certain way if we feel, some, feel something in our hand. So that sensory aspect of the nervous system and the motor aspect of the nervous system is going to be a part of the peripheral nervous system. Okay, so again, back to this thing. Sensory input would be part of the peripheral nervous system or PNS. The integration part in the middle is the CNS, so the brain and spinal cord. And then motor output is going to be PNS again. Okay, so that's another way we can kind of divide um, this layout. And it's going to be this way for, again, any type of sensory motor input output. Um, it's always going to go from peripheral nervous system to the central and then back out to peripheral. Okay. We can divide um, the peripheral nervous system into two functional divisions. So they do different functions, right? We have the sensory division, which I just talked about, bringing sensory information in, and the motor division, bringing motor information back out, okay? And those can be divided into even um, more specific divisions. So in the sensory division, we have somatic sensory fibers that are bringing impulses from the skin, skeletal muscles, and joints to the central nervous system. Okay, so that's the somatic sensory fibers, again, of the peripheral nervous system. And then you have visceral sensory fibers that are going to be conveying impulses from visceral organs. So think of things like your stomach, your heart, lungs, all of those really important organs in your body um, are also going to have some sort of sensory integration. So the visceral component of the sensory division is going to bring information from those visceral organs to the central nervous system. Okay. So after, again, sensory information comes in, um, it goes to the CNS, right? And then motor information is going to be sent back out. And we can divide this again into two divisions, very similar to the sensory divisions. We have somatic um, nervous system conducting impulses from CNS to skeletal muscles, so similar to the somatic sensory fibers. And then the autonomic nervous system is conducting impulses from the central nervous system to those visceral organs, okay? So very similar to that visceral sensory fibers, okay? Um, autonomic nervous system, if we're conducting impulses to these visceral organs, I like to think of if you're going to, say, um, your lungs to change your respiratory rate, though your lungs would be innervated by these autonomic nervous system motor fibers, right? And I like to think autonomic is like automatic, Okay, these um, 
fibers are not under our conscious control, okay? So anything that you think about in your body that is innervated by the nervous system, which is everything, um, so your heart, your lungs, your digestive tract, all of those organs need um, to be stimulated and told what to do to do their functions properly. But we don't have to think about, you know, digesting our food or breathing or our heart pumping, right? So those are all going to be part of this autonomic division, Okay, and again, autonomic, I think automatic, it's stuff that we don't have to think about, okay? Our autonomic nervous system, um, we can divide even further, um, and I'm just going to write it out here. We can have our parasympathetic or our sympathetic. Okay, and these are both part of those, that autonomic nervous system. Um, so all of those organs that I talked about, so for example, um, let's think about our heart rate, right? We can either increase our heart rate or decrease our heart rate, right? So these two um, divisions of the autonomic nervous system have two separate functions. One's going to increase our heart rate um, and uh, stimulate that type of, you know, excite it, excite the organs in our body, and the other one's going to slow everything down. So our sympathetic nervous system is also known as our fight or flight. Okay, so if our sympathetic nervous system is activated, it's going to increase our heart rate, it's going to increase our respiratory rate, um, and it's going to essentially prepare us to fight or flight. So if you're in a situation where you're anxious or get excited, you can feel your heart starting to pound faster, that means your sympathetic nervous system has been activated, right? Um, evolutionarily, that's important for animals in the wild. If you, they see um, something trying to come kill them, their sympathetic nervous system is activated so they can either fight um, that predator or run away. Okay, so the sympathetic is gonna get us ready to fight or flight. And the parasympathetic is the opposite. So our parasympathetic nervous system is also known as our rest and digest. Okay, so if we are in a relaxed state, there's no immediate threat. Our heart rate's going to slow down. Our respiratory rate's going to slow down. And our digestive organs are going to um, increase their functioning. So in parasympathetic, the main thing that's going to be happen is we have digestion occurring because we're relaxed. Our body can use that time to build up its energy reserves, digest, get the nutrients it needs. Whereas if we're in a state of fight or flight during the sympathetic nervous system activation, um, most things increase like our heart rate, respiratory rate, all of that good stuff. Um, but our digestive system is actually going to slow down if our sympathetic nervous system is activated, okay? Because if we're trying to fight off a predator, obviously we don't really care in that moment about digesting our food and getting our nutrients and restoring our energy. Um, we're just trying to get away. So all of our energy um, and the blood's going to be rushed to the organs that can help us fight off a predator uh, most efficiently, okay? So those are the basic divisions of our, again, peripheral nervous system. If you ever see any part of a sensory or motor division, it's going to be, again, part of that peripheral. Stella! Sorry, my dog is barking. Okay? So, again, back to this diagram. Um, sensory, again, PNS, integration, central nervous system, and PNS again. Um... And our sensory information is also called afferent, which we talked about when we talked about our um, homeostasis. And our motor is called efferent. I think efferent, like exit, that information is exiting our central nervous system. Okay, but we can have, again, in our sensory information, that's somatic from our skin, skeletal muscles, or our visceral division from our visceral organs. And then the efferent division, we can also have somatic. So again, information in this case going to our biceps brachii, that would be the somatic division of the efferent division, um, or autonomic, which is information going to our visceral organs. Okay? So here's just a breakdown of 
everything we just talked about, kind of a visual so you can see everything and the main um, points for each division. Central nervous system, there's not many subdivisions, right? But for the peripheral, we can have both sensory and motor, and we can have um, divisions within those as well, okay? All right, so now let's start talking about the tissues in our nervous system. Okay, so there's two primary types of cells um, that make up our entire nervous system. Um, there are what are called neuroglial cells or glial cells um, and neurons. So I'm sure neurons everyone's heard of. Neurons are the actual cells that are going to be transmitting electrical signals and that are excitable. Those are going to be, um, you know, what's doing most of the work of our nervous system. The glial cells are just like little helper cells. Um, so they're going to be smaller cells that surround, wrap um, the neurons, and are really important for maintaining a proper environment for our neurons to function. Okay, so the neurons are kind of finicky. They want a certain um, chemical environment around them. They need certain nutrients, um, yada, yada, yada. So the neuroglial cells are just little cells within our nervous system that, that are there just to support the neurons, make sure that they have everything that they need to function properly. Okay, so let's start by talking about the main types of glial cells that you'll see. Okay, um, so the glial cells in our central nervous system and peripheral nervous system are different. Okay, so you need to know which cells are found in which division of the nervous system. Um, and you also need to know the general function of each type of cell. Okay, so I have a slide for each of these um, coming up. But in our central nervous system, we have astrocytes, microglial cells, epidermal cells and oligodendrocytes. In our peripheral nervous system, we have satellite cells and Schwann cells. Okay, um, so the way I remember which cells are found where, the only two glial cells that start with S are in the peripheral nervous system. Okay, so that helps me keep it straight. I know the two S's are together, um, so they're in the peripheral nervous system and the rest of them are gonna be in the central nervous system. Okay, so now let's talk about each of their functions. So let's start, astrocytes, again, central nervous system. They are the most abundant, versatile, and highly branched glial cells. Um, they are found clung to neurons, synaptic endings, and capillaries. And they have a lot of different functions. Um, they support and brace neurons, kind of hold everything together. Um, they play a role in exchanges between capillaries and neurons, guide migration of young neurons, and control chemical environment around neurons. Okay, so the two main ones I want you to focus on here play a role in exchanges between capillaries and neurons and controlling the chemical environment around neurons. Okay, so if you ever see an image of an astrocyte, you'll always see that they're going to be associated with capillaries. So you see the astrocyte in the picture has these little feet-looking things that are around this capillary. Basically, what the astrocyte is doing is determining what is allowed into the brain or nervous system through these capillaries. Okay, so it wants to make sure that, you know, no bad chemicals or whatever get into that delicate nervous tissue. Okay, so um, this first point plays a role in exchange between capillaries and neurons. We'll talk about this later, um, but this is known as the blood-brain barrier. A lot of times you'll see it abbreviated just BBB. Okay, so it provides this barrier between the blood in the capillary and the brain um, and controls the chemical environment by making sure you know, only certain ions can get through into the brain, certain chemicals can, can get through, no pathogens or anything like that can leak out of the blood capillary and into the brain tissue. Okay, so astrocytes, chemical environment, blood-brain barrier. Okay, the next type of microglial cell, or glial cell, again in the CNS still, are the microglial cells. They're these little small oval type cells um, and they're going to be touching different neurons, and they're basically just monitoring the health, okay? Um, so they are kind of the immune cells of the central nervous system. Okay, so if there's an injured neuron, 
you're going to see a lot of microglial cells surrounding it because they're there to monitor the health um, and can transform to phagocytize microorganisms and neuronal debris. Okay, so if there is some sort of pathogen or microorganism, bacteria that happens to get into the brain through that blood-brain barrier, the microglial cells are the immune cells are going to um, be responsible for killing those cells, making sure the neurons are staying healthy, and if a neuron dies, um, kind of cleaning up the pieces of that neuron. Okay. Next type of cell is our ependymal cells. So again, central nervous system. Um, they are all different shapes. Most of the time you'll see them in like a columnar looking shape and they have these little cilia on the top. Their function is to line the central cavities of the brain and spinal column. Okay, um, and we haven't talked about it yet, but within the brain and spinal cord, we have um, cerebrospinal fluid circulating around. The cerebrospinal fluid is going to bring nutrients um, and help protect um, the cells of the brain from, um, you know, some sort of traumatic injury. It helps cushion the brain, but it's really important for bringing nutrients to the brain. So the ependymal cells actually make the, the cerebrospinal fluid, and then these little cilia on the top of them um, line these cavities filled with CSF and circulate that. So they move their little um, cilia and move that fluid through the brain. Okay. Oligodendrocytes are the next type of cell, again, central nervous system. They are branched cells, and their function whoops, is to form myelin sheaths um, in nerve fibers in the CNS. Okay, and we'll talk about the importance of myelin later on, but basically this myelin um, is this little fatty insulator that covers the axons. So we talked about it when we talked about muscles. The myelin covers the axons of our neurons um, and helps insulate it and propagate action potentials more quickly. Okay, so again, we already talked about this when we talked about muscle physiology a little bit, um, but we'll get way in way more depth talking about action potentials um, and how myelin helps neurons um, uh, propagate their action potentials. Okay, and then the last two type of glial cells, these two, the two S's, are in the peripheral nervous system. Satellite cells surround the cell bodies in the peripheral nervous system. So these purple cells in the picture down here, they have a similar function to astrocytes, so just kind of maintaining the chemical environment, uh, making sure that the neuron has all of the um, ions and nutrients that it needs. And then Schwann cells, also in the peripheral nervous system, um, these Schwann cells are forming myelin in the peripheral nervous system. Okay, so again, similar to oligodendrocytes, just out in the periphery. Okay, so those are the glial cells. Um, and then the other cell type of uh, the nervous system you have to know are the neurons. So these are the actual structural units, the functional units of the nervous system. They are the cells that are going to be being conducting impulses, right, and sending information, uh, bringing either information in from the sensory receptors or sending information back out towards the effectors. Neurons have an extreme longevity, which means they last a person's lifetime, right, um, which makes it even worse that if you get some sort of brain damage or have neurons dying or some sort of neurodegenerative disease, um, if your neurons die, they do not um, replace themselves quickly like the cells in your skin might. Um, so it's really important that you take very good care of your neurons. <laughs> uh, and they have a really high metabolic rate, which means that they require a continuous supply of oxygen and glucose. Um, because, again, they're transmitting these impulses all throughout our body, telling all of our muscles what to do, all of our organs what to do, and that's going to take a lot of energy. So they need a lot of nutrients and oxygen in, in order to do that. Okay. Um, and the anatomy of a neuron, they're all going to have a cell body, 
and then one or more processes coming off of them. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Okay, so the cell body, we're always gonna refer to it as the soma. Um, so in any quiz exam, you're gonna see soma being used, not cell body. So make sure you memorize soma. Um, soma hold, the soma holds all of like the organelles that you would see in a normal cell. Um, so the nucleus with the nucleolus, um, the plasma membrane on the outside of the cell body is going to act as a receptive region that's going to receive input from the other neurons, which we'll talk about when we talk about the action potential later on. Um, and most of the neuron cell bodies are located within the central nervous system. Right, so our peripheral nervous system is just bringing information to and from the periphery of our body. So in the peripheral nervous system, you're going to see mostly axons, right, which are those long things that are going to carry the action potential reaching out. Um, so the cell bodies normally are actually housed within the central nervous system. Okay. We can have clusters of these cell bodies um, in our central nervous system. They're called nuclei. In our peripheral nervous system, which we're only going to find um, really close to the spinal cord, they're called ganglia. And in lab, you'll talk about the dorsal root ganglion. And those are going to be the really only area in the peripheral nervous system that you're going to have cell bodies. Okay. All right, so those are the cell bodies, the soma of the neurons. Neurons, like I said before, also have a number of different processes. Um, so the processes are just extensions that ex extend from the cell body. And again, like I said, central nervous system is going to have mostly the cell bodies, but also processes. Peripheral nervous system is mostly just going to be the processes. You're not going to find many cell bodies in the peripheral nervous system. Okay, if we have a bunch of processes grouped together, so say these are all axons coming through our peripheral nervous system. Um, in the peripheral nervous system, these are going to be called nerves. So we talked about earlier, you have cranial nerves, spinal nerves. All a nerve is is just a bunch of axons bundled together. We can also have this in the central nervous system. In bundles of processes in the central nervous system are called tracks. Okay. And there are two types of processes. Um, axons, which you're definitely familiar with, since we talked about those in um, our muscle physiology chapter. But there are also dendrites that are processes extending from the soma. Okay. So let's start by talking about dendrites. So dendrites are important because they're going to receive input um, from other neurons or sensory receptors. So they are going to be um, receiving information, okay? So they receive information, and they are going to send that information towards the cell body as a graded potential. And we'll talk about what a graded potential is um, probably in the second part of this lecture. Okay, but there's just a short distance signal getting information from the dendrite to the cell body. So the graded potential is similar to an action potential, but it's just going a short distance. Okay, some areas of our brains, our dendrites are going to be really specialized and have what are called dendritic spines, which are, if, you, if I zoom into this picture, if this is our dendrite receiving information, all of these little offshoots, those are all dendritic spines. And what that does is increase the surface area of the dendrite um, to allow more things to come onto it and send information to this neuron. Okay, so anywhere you see a dendritic spine, you're gonna have um, you know, something synapsing onto that where information can then be transmitted to that neuron and then move down that neuron's axon and go elsewhere in the body. Okay, so the more dendritic spines, the more dendrites a neuron has, the more information it can receive. Okay. The other type of um, process of a neuron is the axon. Okay. Okay. 
Every neuron has one axon that starts as a cone-shaped area called the axon hillock. Okay, and that's going to be coming off of the soma. Okay, so if you have your soma here, you have dendrites coming off of it, there's going to be like a little cone that the axon attaches to the soma. That little cone is called the axon hillock. Okay. Um, depending on the type of neuron, where you're at in the body, you can have really long axons or, or really short axons. Um, it just depends on the type of neuron. Um, so if you think about the nerves that run from your spinal cord all the way to the tips of your finger, there are axons that are that entire length, right? Because that information, again, the cell bodies are in the CNS. So if you have this cell body in your brain or spinal cord, you have to have an axon that can reach all the way to the very tips of your toes or tips of your fingers. So you're going to have some really long axons in your body, Okay. Long axons are often going to be called nerve fibers. Axons can also have branches off of them. So we talked about the neuromuscular junction. We saw axons that had um, kind of branches that can synapse onto many different muscle fibers. Those are called axon collaterals. And at the very end of the axon, you're going to see a lot of branches. Okay. And these branches are going to branch off right, and synapse onto something. So if we're at like a neuromuscular junction, this is a muscle here. <laughs> Remember where the axon is going to synapse onto the muscle is called the axon terminal. Okay, so at the very end of the axon, you're going to have at least one axon terminal. Okay, but depending on how many axon collaterals or axon branches you have, you might have um, more than one axon terminal per axon. Okay, and the axon terminal, again, is going to synapse onto something, so it can send information from the neuron to um, some sort of effector or some other um, neuron. Okay, so functional characteristics of an axon. Um, again, we talked about it in the muscle uh, chapter, but the axon is the conducting region of a neuron. Okay, it's going to conduct nerve impulses, also known as action potentials, and transmits them along the axolemma, which is just the cell membrane of the axon, a fancy word for that, and transmit that action potential all the way down to the axon terminal, so that very end of the axon that's going to synapse onto something else. The axon terminal is going to be the region that's secreting a neurotransmitter, Right, which when we talked about the neuromuscular junction, we talked about acetylcholine and how that was a neurotransmitter that was responsible for activating our muscle cells. Um, and depending on the type of neurotransmitter released, um, the action potential can either inhibit or excite um, neurons or effectors that it's coming into contact with. So when we saw the release of acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction, we saw that it excited the muscle cell, caused it con to contract. We can also have neurotransmitters that are going to be responsible for inhibiting um, our um, effector or other neurons. Okay. And axons, um, neurons, can carry many conversations with different neurons at the same time. Again, we have those axon collaterals, different branches off the axon that are going to be synapsing onto, say, we have three different or four different right, axon terminals at the end of this axon. That can synapse onto four different neurons, right? And those are each going to be able to communicate with other neurons. So you're going to have a lot of conversations, if you will, happening at the same time. Okay? And axons are going to rely on the cell body the soma, right, of the neuron to create the energy and the proteins that it needs in order for it to transmit the action potential down, okay? So like I said, the micro, the uh, organelles are all going to be found in the soma of the axon, of the, not the axon, the neuron. So the axon is not going to be like making energy or making protein like a normal cell will, would, all of that stuff is going to be happening in the soma of the neuron, okay? The axon only function of that is to conduct the action potentials. Okay.
There are, however, um, many different internal transport mechanisms in the axon, right? Because if all of our stuff is made in the soma and we have axons that are meters long running from our spinal cord to the tips of our toes, um, there needs to be some way to transport material um, to and from the soma, okay? So there's these special organelles found in the axon that are responsible for moving stuff along um, down to the axon terminal. Okay, and movement can occur in both directions within the axon this way. So we can have anterograde, um, which means away from the cell body, away from the soma. So in this case, we're going that way, anterograde. So mitochondria for energy, different cytoskeletal en en elements, membrane components, enzymes, um, stuff that's made in the soma has to be moved down through anterograde. Retrograde is moving things back towards the cell body. Okay, so um, if we have, you know, organelles that are um, old in our axon that need to be broken down, those have to go back to the soma um, where you have lysosomes that are going to actually break down those old organelles. Okay, and it's, it says here that some bacterial toxins work through retrograde transmission as well. Um, so different things like polio, rabies, um, and some other viruses actually get into the soma of neurons through retrograde transmission. Okay, so they're going to kind of hitch a ride on different molecules in the axon and make their way back to the soma of the neuron where they can kind of take over, um, which obviously is not good. <laughs> okay. All right, next part of anatomy we have to talk about is the myelin sheath, which we talked about in the CNS is made of those oligodendrocytes. And then the PNS is made of Schwann cells. Okay, and remember the myelin is a, um, if we have an axon here, the myelin is going to be like an insulation. You're going to see little balls of myelin around the axon of a neuron. Okay, it's normally going to look pretty white, and it is a protein lipid substance. Um, but the important thing here is the function of myelin. Okay, so myelin is really important because it protects axons and also is going to electrically insulate them. And what that means, it's going to increase the speed of a nerve impulse transmission. Okay, so when we talk about the action potential, the action potential is sent down the axon of a neuron. If we have myelin surrounding that axon, it allows the action potential to move more quickly down the axon to increase the rate of that action potential, which is good because, again, we want to be able to respond quickly. So the quicker the action potential can move down the axon, um, the quicker we can react to different things. Okay. Myelinated fibers, um, again, are these segmented myelin that's going to surround um, most axons, especially the big ones. We also have axons, neurons that are non-myelinated. Um, obviously, those are not going to contain myelin. And there are those in our body, um, and they still work, but they're just going to conduct impulses more slowly. Okay, So anytime you have an um, axon that's really long, so going from our spinal cord to our feet, that axon is going to want to be insulated by myelin so that we can um, get information down to our feet more quickly, okay? If there was no myelin, it would take significantly longer for information to travel all the way down to our toes, okay? Again, I just said this on the last slide, but in the peripheral nervous system, myelin is formed by Schwann cells. Okay, and Schwann cells are going to wrap the axon. Um, one Schwann cell is going to roll up around the axon and kind of create this like little snail. I don't know. It just wraps around, keeps wrapping and wrapping and wrapping, um, as you can see in the image here, to create the myelin. In the central nervous system, uh, just kidding, <laughs> still in the peripheral nervous system, um, we have myelin sheath gaps, which are gaps between adjacent Schwann cells. 
So I zoom in here. Myelin sheath gap. Again, each one of these is a Schwann cell. And there's gaps between those. Those are also known as um, nodes of Ron VA. Myelin sheath, sheath gap. So the little spaces between the myelin where we can see the axon. Okay. Um, and we also again have non-myelinated fibers that sometimes can have Schwann cells near them, but they don't coil around them and wrap them up. Um, so they're considered non-myelinated still. Okay. In the central nervous system, oligodendrocytes are going to be creating the myelin. Um, and these are a little bit different than Schwann cells because instead of the whole cell wrapping around the axon, you're going to have one oligodendrocyte that branches off and forms multiple different um, myelin fibers. Okay. Again, you're going to have the myelin sheath, that space, the not myelin sheath, the gap, or the node of Ranvier. Again, that's how you're going to see it on quizzes, node of Ranvier are just those gaps between myelin, okay? And it can be the myelin either in the CNS or PNS. It doesn't matter, okay? In our brain, in the next chapter, we'll talk about um, where we can find white matter and gray matter. And some of you might have heard of that before. Um, white matter is just going to be regions of the brain and spinal cord that have mostly myelinated fibers, Okay, so if you have an area of the brain that has a lot of axons covered in this myelin, again, this myelin is like a fatty substance, so it makes that brain tissue look white. Okay, and that's all white matter it is. It's just myelinated axons. Gray matter is either cell bodies or non-myelinated fibers. Okay, so when you see gray matter in the brain, that's mostly just going to be the somas of our neurons, or non-myelinated um, axons, right? We can classify neurons by the number of processes they have, okay? So there's three different classes. Um, we have multipolar neurons, bipolar neurons, and unipolar neurons. Okay, and it's just named based on how many processes are coming off the soma. So multipolar neurons are going to be the neurons you're going to see depicted most um, frequently in the book. So multipolar neurons, your soma, you have three or more processes coming off of it. Okay, bipolar neurons, I think bi, there's two. So bipolar neurons have two processes. And unipolar neurons have only one process coming off of it. Okay, so if I zoom in here, this would be a multipolar. Okay, because we have a soma and we have more than three. We have a lot of dendrites and an axon coming off of the soma. A bipolar neuron, again our soma, we have one axon coming off and one dendrite. Again, you can still have axon collaterals, and these dendrites can split further up, but off of the cell body itself, there's only two processes. And then unipolar, also known as pseudo-unipolar, off of the cell body, there's just one little branch, and it's going to split eventually, but again, cell body, there's just one offshoot. Okay. Okay. So this would be um, the structural classification, right? Naming these different types of neuron based off of their structure, what they look like. Okay, and in this class, we're not going to get really too far into all this stuff um, where you can different find these different types. Because um, there's a lot of different structural vari variations. So you can see down here, these are both multipolar, bipolar, and this unipolar. Um, and it tells you where they're each found. Um, if you're in an upper level neuroscience class, you'll definitely talk about this. But for our purposes, as long as you know the three 
um, different structural classifications, then you'll be okay. Okay? You can also classify neurons based on their function. So this would be a functional classification. Okay? Um, and these, we, this, these three functions of the nervous system we already talked about, so you should already know what this means. But you can have sensory neurons or afferent, and those are going to go to the central nervous system. We can have motor neurons or efferent, and those neurons are going to be leaving the central nervous system. And then the last type are interneurons, which are going to be housed within the central nervous system. Okay? Um, so this is just, again, kind of reiterating the things that we talked about. Um, sensory neurons are mostly going to be unipolar. Um, we have some sensory neurons that are bipolar, um, like the um, sensory neurons in the retina of our eye. And then most motor neurons are going to be multipolar. Okay. All right. And now we're going to start kind of talking about some physiology. So before we actually talk about the physiology of an action potential, um, I'm just going to reiterate some stuff we've already talked about and we talked about the muscles, and that is resting membrane potential. Okay. Like all cells, neurons also have a resting membrane potential. This resting membrane potential is what's going to allow the neurons to be able to communicate and send impulses. Okay. Neurons can rapidly change their resting membrane potential, and they're highly excitable. Okay? Mm -hmm. So neurons are really good at communicating, and they can do it very quickly, which is important, again, so that information can travel through our body. Okay? Mm -hmm. To understand action potentials, you need to understand some basic principles of electricity. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously, some of this stuff is... It's pretty straightforward, but opposite charges are going to be attracted to each other. Energy is going to be required to keep opposite charges separated across a membrane, right? Because if we have a cell membrane and negative charge inside, positive charge outside, these are going to be attracted to each other, so they're going to want to go move towards each other. So we need energy to separate charges. And this last point here, um, when opposite charges are separated, the system has potential energy, right? So we talked about kinetic energy and potential energy in the chapter on chemistry. Potential energy, remember, is the, the um, chemical <laughs> potential to cause a change, right, to do work. Okay, so potential energy, if we have a positive charge on one side and a negative charge on the other, there's potential here because the um, ions are attracted to each other, so they want um, to come closer to each other. So same thing when we talked about like in chapter two, if you have a ball on the top of a hill, that ball has potential energy because it has energy sto stored up um, and it could move down that hill, right? And that's potential energy. Once something is in motion, then that potential energy turns to kinetic energy. Okay, but a separation of charge creates, again, potential energy, okay? And that's what's really going to um, make this resting membrane potential. This separation of charge makes it so that our um, cell membrane has this potential and these ions are going to want to move and create these impulses, okay? So some definitions um, that you might see, I'm not going to quiz you on these, but it might help you to, if you know what these mean, Voltage is a measure of potential energy separated, um, generated by separated charge. So when we look at our resting membrane potential, there's going to be a, a voltage across that membrane. 
okay? And the voltage, again, is just a separated charge. If you have a positive charge outside, negative charge inside, there's going to be voltage there, okay? It can also be called potential difference or just potential, okay? So the resting membrane potential, same thing as a voltage. Current is the flow of electrical charge. I mean, in our case, it's going to be ions between two points. And then resistance is the hindrance to charge flow. Okay. So for our resting membrane potential, um, ion channels are going to play a major role. Okay. So we already talked about ion channels, right? They're going to be those large proteins embedded in our cell membrane. They're going to be selectively permeable to allow ions to move. Okay. Again, selectively permeable means they only allow certain things to pass through. So if you have a potassium channel, it's only allowing potassium to come through. Okay, so even though there's this ion channel in the membrane, not everything can move through it, only certain ions. It's selectively permeable. Okay, and we're going to see two main types of um, these ion channels, which we already talked about these in a previous chapter, but leakage channel or non-gated are channels that are just always open. So if they're leaky, think that, say this is a leaky potassium channel, potassium can just leak through whenever it wants, okay? Always open. Gated channels um, are not always open. So they have the ability to have a conformational change. So they can go from a closed state, right, where ions can't pass through. So this potassium, when it's closed, they can't pass through. <laughs> Once they open, there's a conformational change and they're able to, um, the ions are able to move through. So gated means there's, it needs something in order to open. Okay, so it can either open um, with chemicals. So it's chemically gated. You'll also see this called ligand gated. It can be voltage gated. So it needs some sort of voltage in order to open or it can be mechanically gated. Mechanically gated channels um, need some sort of like physical pressure or touch or stimulation uh, physically in order to open, okay? So here's more information about the different types of gated channels. So chemically gated, again, only open with binding of a specific chemical. So just like the channels only allow certain ions to move, um, these gated channels need a specific signal in order to open, okay? So we can have chemically, chemically gated channels that open only to a specific neurotransmitter. So in the neuromuscular junction, we had acetylcholine chemically gated channel. So you needed the neuron to release acetylcholine in order for these channels on um, the end plate of the muscle to open, right? Voltage-gated channels, again, are going to be opening and closing in response to a change in that voltage or a change in that membrane potential. And again, mechanically-gated channels open in response to some physical deformation. Okay, So you're going to see this mostly in sensory receptors. We're not going to really talk about it um, in this chapter too much. But in some sensory receptors, like when you feel pressure on your skin... Those are going to be all mechanically gated channels. So the physical touch on your skin is going to activate those channels. Okay. And all of these channels are going to allow for passive diffusion. Okay. So as long as the channels open, ions are going to want to move um, down their concentration gradient and also um, their electrical gradient towards the opposite charge. Okay, and we'll talk about this a little bit more in detail when we talk about the action potential. Okay. So neurons are said to have what is called the electrochemical gradient, which means that there's a separation of electrical charge and there's a separation of chemical concentrations. Okay. Ion flow creates an electrical current and voltage change across the membrane, okay? So it's this combination of the separation of charge, the electrical gradient, 
and the chemical gradient or the separation of concentrations of different ions that allow for action potentials to work. Okay. And we can measure this um, using a device called a voltmeter. Okay. And it's this little, I'll go to the next slide real quick. It's this little spike that you can insert, it's literally insert into a very small um, cell. So you can actually insert it into the axon of a neuron. And you can read the voltage or charge different acro difference across the membrane. Okay, so the resting membrane potential, all cells have it, but a neuron's resting membrane potential is around negative 70 millivolts. Okay, so the cytoplasm side of the membrane inside of the cell is going to be negative, negatively charged compared to the outside, okay? And that's about negative 70 millivolts, okay? Um, it can actually vary depending on the neuron and whatever, but I'm always going to say negative 70 millivolts is the resting membrane potential. And because, we, again, we have this separation of charge, positive and negative, we can say that that membrane is polarized, So again, we can use um, a voltmeter to actually physically measure that, which is kind of cool. Um, and this potential, this separation of charge, is generated by differences in ionic composition between the intracellular fluid and extracellular fluid, and differences in plasma membrane permeability. Okay, so we have some ions that are allowed to move in and out freely, some that are stuck on either inside or outside of the membrane. Okay, and again, it's going to be really important that you understand at rest where different ions you're going to find them more concentrated. Okay, so I talked about this in previous chapters as well, but I like to remember this by thinking of um, an island. <laughs> okay, and on your island, again, I've said this uh, so many times, but on your island, think of the islands like inside of the cell. Inside of the cell, all you have is a banana. Okay, bananas have potassium. So inside the cell on your island, you have a higher concentration of potassium because you have that banana on your island with you. Surrounding the island is salt water, right? So outside of the cell, salt is sodium chloride. So you have a high concentration of sodium, high concentration of chloride outside of the cell. And then also there's uh, calcium outside of the cell. So I like to think... Maybe there's a coconut floating in the salt water, and there's coconut milk, which has calcium in it, maybe. I don't really know, but that's what we're going with. Okay, so in your cell, on your island, you have a high concentration of bananas. That's all you have, your survival food. So all you have inside your cell is potassium. Outside, salt, sodium chloride, and calcium from your coconut. <laughs> okay? If you can remember this the action potential um, is going to make a lot more sense. All right. Um, I think I'm going to stop here. So the, in uh, part two of this lecture, we will cover um, the actual action potential.